Professor Janneke was member of the Energy Council of the Berlin State Government from 1989 to 1997. From 1986 to 2007, he was the director of the Environmental Policy Research Center of Fry University. He has a he was a member of the German National Committee on Global Change Research and of the Government Advisory Council on the Environment from 1999 to 2008. Since 2003, he has been a board member of the Deutsche Bundesstiftung Umwelt and member of the International Advisory Board of the Wuppertal Institute. His lecture topic today is climate mitigation, lessons from best practice. Please, a warm welcome to Professor Dr. Martin Yenica. Good morning, everybody. I can immediately proceed where Dr. Sittel has stopped. <clears throat> I want to speak about climate policy, and um, I want to focus on best practice. <clears throat> that means, uh, that is a choice, of course. That means I don't speak about the glass that is half uh, empty, but on the glass that is half full. Uh, we have, uh, as you know, many, many sad stories about uh, the climate negotiations. The international climate regime is in a very bad fashion and the uh, forecast is not good regarding this uh, policy. On the other hand, and quite different, we have many, many success stories about the booming markets of climate-friendly technologies. Climate policy in terms of industrial policy is by far more successful. And I want to speak about this climate policy in terms of industrial policy. <clears throat> Why do I uh, prefer best practice? Uh, it is a shorter uh, story, of course, but we need the knowledge about best practice if we want to be ambitious. Uh, we must know what has been successful to proceed on a more successful way. <clears throat> and I want to focus uh, uh, on uh, uh, examples of best practice where uh, policy and technical change has been even accelerated. <clears throat> um, climate policy in terms of industrial policy, that is in more and more countries, this is uh, dominant. Uh, there's a statement of the OECD saying in some countries decisions on investment in green growth and cleaner energy did not seem to have been directly related to the impacts of climate change, but to economic advantages. And that is my story. <clears throat> the speed of change, global change, regarding climate-friendly uh, developments can be uh, seen here if you take this figure that is uh, already uh, 120 or nearly 120 countries have targets for to introduce renewable energy, partly very ambitious targets. I will show some of them. And this figure has doubled within only four years. This is, shows the high speed of change. And another figure is more interesting. That is um, <clears throat> the share of uh, newly added capacity to produce electricity. Uh, worldwide. And you see that uh, in Europe, the newly added capacity uh, uh, for power production, uh, there you find that 71% uh, already is capacity for green electricity. 71% in 2011. And this share is rapidly increasing and unexpectedly increasing. <clears throat> the European Commission did not expect this. And uh, if you see uh, the global figures, there again we see that half of the new investment in uh, power production is uh, investment in installations to produce green electricity. <clears throat> By the way, uh, USA is, is lower here, but in the last year, USA had achieved uh, the figure of 50%, and in January of this year, no, no other <laughs> investment was done uh, than green electricity. Huh? 
uh, that may show uh, the high speed of change. What is the reason for this change, for this rapid change, for this kind of success story? <clears throat> it is a very rapid decrease of costs. You see on the left hand the costs of solar PV, for instance, uh, and on the right hand you, you see the costs, uh, the curve of um, uh, uh, the transport related technologies, uh, plug in uh, hybrids, second generation biofuels, and such things. This goes down, and on the other hand, the costs, as shown before by Dr. Zittel, costs for oil, for coal, for uh, gas, for nuclear energy go up. Uh, and this is a stable trend. <clears throat> and that means more and more countries see that in the long run, uh, renewable energy are the cheapest energies. Uh, if they are written off, if you have photovoltaic may be expensive now, but if it is written off, it is a very inexpensive, uh, cheap uh, energy. <clears throat> um, to, only to show one uh, argument uh, d um, <clears throat> regarding coal, um, you know uh, uh, one of the few, <laughs> now few exporters of coal is Australia, and even in Australia, new coal power stations are uh, more expensive than new wind power uh, stations. That is a new study made by Bloomberg New Energy. I was uh, very astonished about that because uh, this difference is so, so big. And <clears throat> uh, in several countries, uh, solar energy is, has also become competitive. It is. Uh, competitive uh, regarding grid uh, parity also in, in Germany uh, also to the, uh, regard, uh, regarding the grid parity. <clears throat> that looks good. <clears throat> but uh, you know climate change is accelerating and this is a danger of course. And um, the question is can policy also be accelerated? Can technical change be also accelerated? Technical change in the direction of low carbon, climate friendly technologies? And the answer is yes. I will show you examples of two kinds. The one kind is the acceleration which uh, is um, uh, achieved by a, a certain type of interactive innovation processes that can be organized by intelligent govern governance. And the other is multi-level governance. There is also an acceleration or a multi-level reinforcement possible, um, uh, it's mainly in Europe. <coughs> the both types I will describe. Um, I said it is possible to, itch to accelerate policies. Uh, to take uh, the German example, we had in the year 2000, a, a very ambitious and contested target to have 20% electricity from renewables. And um, then the policy was implemented and the uh, uh, development, the market growth was unexpected, had an unexpected high speed. And uh, after nine years, this target, the old target, was not contested but seen insufficient and a new target was uh, fixed um, 30%. One year, only one year later, the target was 35%. And now the proposal is proposed by the environment minister that we should have 40%, and this is, seems possible. That is a German case. By far more interesting and dramatic is the Chinese case. The same structure, on the right hand you see the targets and the dynamic of targets, on the le left hand you see the, the growth uh, of uh, <coughs> Uh, the installation of, uh, in this case, case wind power. Uh, China, 10 years ago, had a, at that time, very ambitious target to have 20,000 megawatt wind capacity. And then the policy was implemented and it, uh, it was more successful than expected with growth rates what, uh, of, of 100% per year. And um, uh, in 2011, already uh, 20, 62 thousand mega, megawatt wind power had been installed. And as again, as a policy feedback to this unexpected 
growth and unexpected dynamic as a policy feedback, the targets have been increased <clears throat> from 20,000 to 30,000 to 100,000, 150,000. Now it is 200,000 megawatt. Uh, that is nearly the double of the capacity of Germany, no? only wind. And the target for 2050 is in China 1,000 gigawatt, 1,000, uh, you know, a million mega, megawatt, so to speak, the target for 2050. Um, that may be uh, high, too high speed, and it is maybe difficult to manage such a speed of, of change, such revolutionary. It is a technical revolution, huh? clearly. Uh, but it is uh, uh, worthwhile to see uh, how things happen if you uh, focus on best practice. <clears throat> I have studied 10 cases of this type, only renewable energy. No? And of course, the renewable energy is the easiest part of uh, climate policy. And not so easy is a part of uh, to support energy efficiency. But again, here we have success stories. And um, um, uh, one success story is the British case. Again, the same structure. On the right hand, you'd see the targets. Um, Britain has reduced uh, greenhouse gases uh, already by more than 28 percent in the last in uh, 2011, and this was mainly achieved by uh, supporting energy efficiency, by market growth of ins insulation technologies, better heating technology, and such such things. Here we have the same structure for energy efficiency, <coughs> and. Uh, most in interesting is that there are also uh, already uh, policy conclusions. Uh, this is a new phenomenon no? that I have described, quite new and, and optimistic uh, phenomenon, so to speak. Um, the IPCC has de described it with, with the word virtuous cycle, no? this kind of innovation processes. Uh, and um, the Indian government, in its uh, solar energy program of 2009 has made a conclusion that is exactly the policy conclusion that should be drawn from this phenomenon. They say the ambitious target for 20, uh, 2022 of 20,000 megawatt or more, huh? or more, will be dependent on the learning of the first two phases. In the second phase, after taking into account the experience of the initial years, Capacity will be aggressively ramped up to create conditions for upscaled and competitive solar energy penetration of the country. That is a lesson that India has learned from China. <clears throat> but it is a very interesting information. <clears throat> um, I skip the theoretical explanation. There is a theoretical uh, explanation that uh, uh, focuses on on three cycles, the policy cycle, the market cycle, and the innovation cycle. And the inter interaction of the three cycles, that are, this is a message, no? that, that can be organized. No? <clears throat> and India's, India has shown that it is possible. And Indian solar energy development is, is uh, now also on the way in this, in this sense. <clears throat> I said there are two modes of the creation, poss possible acceleration. The other one is inter, uh, uh, is um, multi-level governance. You know the, the political system of the world has many levels from global to local or even individual. And um, it can be shown that uh, at least in Europe, but partly also in India and China partly also, the United States are uh, partly also a similar case, it can be shown that uh, uh, the, uh, the vertical uh, interaction can be very dynamic. And let me show this for, for Europe. You may know that uh, Europe has reduced its uh, greenhouse gas emissions last year by nearly 19%. That's not bad. And you see that in the last year's is a, uh, there's an increase of reduction. No? There's a kind of acceleration. And um, this may be partly explained by the mechanism I already, I already have described. This, uh, the other mechanism may be the following. <clears throat> 
if you go into the countries that are mostly contributing to this improvement, then you uh, come to UK, Germany, Denmark mainly. And I have uh, studied the three countries uh, uh, and looked at the different levels. And it is very interesting to see that the three pioneer countries in Europe have um, started at the national level. There was a national ambitious climate policy in the three countries, and then they entered the European level uh, and influenced the European policy. After 2007, the European policy was more ambitious than before, and uh, Europe was active in the climate negotiations and so on. But very interesting is to see that when this European policy was established, and the global trend was, then the process uh, was visible at the lower level. The three countries have been influenced on the lower level by the, their success on the higher level. Huh? The Europeanization of their policy also influenced uh, the development on the, on the province level, of the city level, of the level of <coughs> local communities. Um, for instance, in Germany, we have we have now one, one uh, federal state saying we want to have 300% renewable energy. No? Uh, Scotland, at the same level, be, below the national level, Scotland has a, uh, again a 100% target for 2020 already. Um, and there are many cities, of course, you, you may know this, that are active. What I want to show you is <coughs> that the last player, the last mover, so to speak, in this process are, have been the local communities. But now we can see that co local communities may have the biggest potential. Because uh, um, in, in, in Germany and in, in Denmark, you can see that man, many cooperatives, for instance, um, um, have invested into renewables and so on. And we have in Germany this institution of so-called 100% renewable energy regions. You see the map, um, <clears throat> the map that is one quarter of the country with 20 million people that are uh, part of this process. And 100% uh, renewable energy uh, re regions want to introduce, um, uh, of course, wind power, photovoltaic, and biogas, biomass, ga uh, electricity. And that means they are able, to a certain degree, to have a balanced supply. On the decentral level, you can have a balanced supply, because biogas can be used to compensate wind power fluctuations. So that you actually don't need the big grid so much. You should have it, of course. We should have a European grid, but um, uh, it is a very decentralized process, and the majority of owners are individual people, peasants, individual pe persons. Um, <clears throat> uh, I have heard the, the figure that uh, out of 60 persons in Germany, one is an energy producer. No? <clears throat> That is very remarkable, I would say. Let me shortly, uh, since we are in Germany, um, uh, summarize the German case of climate policy in terms of industrial policy. We have uh, reduced uh, greenhouse gases by 25.6% last year. And this was mainly in the building sector, where 40,000 40 million tons of CO2 have been reduced. Um, and you see that uh, a mix of standards was necessary. Building standards, building codes that have been uh, made stricter and stricter. Very important is the German ecotax. The revenue of the German ecotax of about 18 billion was mainly used uh, to reduce the social security uh, payments of, uh, uh, of uh, workers. And that means that uh, uh, labor has been become cheaper for enterprises. And you may know that in Germany, different from nearly all OECD countries, has a very good employment situation. The increase of employment reduction, very far reduction of unemployment since that time. It's not only the ecotax, but uh, the ecotax is part of this success story. <clears throat> and um, the other sector is uh, transport sector, traffic, 
traffic sector where um, about 30 million tons CO2 have been, have been reduced. And um, there is a new car tax supporting diesel motors, diesel. Uh, and this is an industrial policy act because in Germany, diesel motors are uh, fuel efficient, not gasoline, but fuel diesel. And uh, to support diesel was a part, part of this process. Um, the process where the German car, car industry was promoted with climate change arguments. No? <clears throat> um, also, a toll on highways and such things have been important, but um, I would say this reduction, which is extremely difficult to achieve, uh, is mainly has mainly been achieved by uh, the Ecotex. <clears throat> um, and there is, of course, an employment effect. Uh, alone, a renewable energy has uh, uh, an employment effect for, of about 400,000. Um, I must uh, say I have not the time to, to speak about the problems, of course. Uh, there are problems of the uh, photovoltaic industry in Germany, also in China, by the way. Uh, Suntec has big problems. Huh? Um, but um, so far, I, I uh, uh, focus on the, the success story, also from time reasons. <clears throat> um, but uh, this success story of, uh, of um, renewable energy uh, is part of a general success story in Germany uh, regarding the green sector. The green sector in 2011 was or already 11% of the GDP, 11%. Although there is not included organic farming, ecotourism is not included. No, that's come, it's, it should, that has to be added. But um, the de development is um, interesting because there was a study in 2006 from Roland Berger uh, showing this red curve you see. <clears throat> Everybody was very uh, astonished about that, uh, including myself. I was, uh, that was, uh, ne I, ne I had never have seen such things before. And the interesting thing is that uh, six years later, in two, in the last year, there was a new study showing uh, the real growth rate and the, the, uh, the forecast of the growth rate was 8% and the real growth rate was, um, 12%. That means the red line is, uh, goes up with a higher speed. Uh, that is typical for this kind of unexpected change. <clears throat> yeah, to summarize this positive aspect, uh, there is a clear contradiction between the very slow progress in international climate negotiations and the high dynamics of international competition on the global markets of clean energies. Climate policy in terms of industrial policy has become the second leg. Innovation plays a strategic role in this dynamic process and uh, a dynamic governance of clean energy markets can be observed as well in OECD countries as in countries like China and India. <clears throat> Therefore, mobilizing economic interests for climate policy is very, very important. It is not all we have to do, but it is the most important part. Part to translate climate policy objectives into the language of industrial policy and market formation, and that has been proven to be a strong option in several pioneer countries. And I hope that it can be used as a motor to achieve a better, better solution in the international climate negotiations. That is a hope, but we need hope, of course. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Dr. Yannicka. We have time for a couple of questions, so, yeah. yeah. Thank you for this presentation which more or less shows the second part. I, I was talking about what's, what should be changed, what's going down, 
and you just uh, explained what's going to yeah. change. And so it's a competition between these two trends, what's going faster. And so we need these movements, developments. But nevertheless, uh, one, one figure I wanted to, to look at more, this was the greenhouse gas emissions in Europe, this figure. We have claimed in 2009 it was declining so fast. Yeah. And this decline predominantly, yeah. of course, was due to the recession. So in southern Europe, for instance. And uh, uh, climate, uh, there's also a, a component Certainly there's of, a share of it, but, it was but this a warm was a time. time. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, nevertheless, 19% is uh, not bad. It is not enough, by the way, uh, of course. Uh, um, if this is our path, then we uh, may end up uh, with 60% uh, in 2050. And the target also for the European Union is 80 to 95 percent. No? We are not on this path so far. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was uh, really interesting. And regarding the German case, I was interested in a more political aspect. Uh, do you think that all the improve? Like, what would you or which? Is the driving factor for such an improvement in the um, reduction of uh, uh, greenhouse gas and uh, the improvement in the production of renewable, <coughs> en um, renewable energies in Germany? Is it, is it a bottom-up uh, uh, process? Do you think is that uh, the culture among the German population influenced uh, policymakers? Or is it more, uh, as you said at the end, driven by the fact that uh, the German authorities and the German industries realized that product, uh, producing renewable energies was cheaper? Or is it both? Because, um, yeah, I think Germany should be uh, an st studied and set as an example of a successful uh, example of uh, this kind of policies for the rest of Europe. And I would like you know, to understand what, what is the reason and what are the rationale the, the reason that I actually um, made this happen. Hmm. Yeah, that is of course very important and uh, it is necessary to say that um, Germany and Great Britain, the, the both uh, pioneers in Europe, have both special factors that have supported this kind of policy. In Germany it was a unification uh, when, when the eastern part uh, with lignite coal and, and energy intensive industries had a, a recession of this kind of industry. This, this kind of industry broke down and of course this had a very remarkable effect on CO2 re emissions. No? In other words, it was easier for Germany to start on this basis. Uh, it was not utopic to, to see that it is possible to reduce CO2. In no other countries this was, has been seen, but in Germany it was already the case. Uh, and Britain had a, had a similar situation when Mrs. Thatcher uh, started her fight against the uh, um, 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 uh, trade union of the mining sector. Uh, it was a political fight, a fight uh, also, of course, against Labour Party. But uh, it was the basis was this uh, this um, trade union, and um, the result of this fight was that uh, the coal mining was go going down, and gas was in imp improved, and there was a support for for support for nuclear. And then came the European Commission and said, you cannot support one single uh, energy um, nuclear, and then they must, uh, Mrs. Thatcher had to include in, into this subsidy also the renewables. No? Uh, and that means that um, from completely different motives, they started with a good policy. No? Um, and both countries had it easier to start, but uh, but the, the later development has uh, needs a, a different explanation. Um, and in Germany, it may be you asked for, for bottom up. <coughs> Germany has a very high de degree of uh, organization of green uh, NGOs, uh, about seven million. Uh, that is a very high degree of ne nearly the same degree of uh, trade unions. Huh? <coughs> Um, by far more more green or, or, uh, organized people than party members, for instance. 
um, that may be one uh, additional factor. But um, I would say the most most important uh, thing in the last uh, ten years is the dynamic that has been pushed, and everybody is watching it. Huh? No scientist has invented this. Huh? It is it is a product of learning by doing. Huh? And on, on this uh, different levels and, and supporting uh, interaction and uh, multi-level reinforcement and also this dynamic processes, nobody or body has invented this. And it was observed and then uh, pushed. Huh? Then <clears throat> more and more, we, we, we are as, as scientists in a situation that we more and more see there are innova the innovations that don't come from, from science. Huh? We have to, 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 to observe it, to describe it, to explain it, and finally to draw conclusions. No? That is a new situation of policy uh, uh, science no? here. <clears throat> um, it is not easy to, dis to explain this development, indeed. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Professor Janneke, we now have to move on. So please, a big hand for the professor.